and make your way over to Psalm 69. What is the worst thing that's ever happened to you in your life? What's the worst thing that's happened to you? Maybe it was a loss of a loved one. Maybe it was something that happened in your childhood. What's the worst thing that happened to you this past year? Maybe you lost your job. Maybe you found out you had cancer. What's the worst thing that's ever happened to you? I want you to keep that in mind throughout this message. And I want to ask you, have you ever thanked God for that worst thing that's ever happened to you? Wait a minute, preacher. You saying thank God for that? <laughs> You've got to be crazy. I won't ever thank God for that. Worst thing that ever happened to me. Well, I hope before we're finished today that you will be able to thank God for the worst thing that ever happened to you in your life. Today we're going to talk about the sacrifice of thanksgiving. The sacrifice of thanksgiving. Now I recognize that this message may be the hardest message that some of you have ever heard. And I acknowledge that. And I have been praying for you as I've been preparing to bring this message because I know it can be very difficult. But I believe that if you will offer up to God the sacrifice of thanksgiving, that you will see healing come to your soul and spirit that you've not seen before. I think you will see a refreshing in your spirit that you've not seen before. First question, what is the sacrifice of thanksgiving? Well, there are several places in the Scriptures where we see the sacrifice of thanksgiving mentioned. One is over in Psalm 27. Now, the sacrifice of thanksgiving is giving thanks to God in what seems to be a thankless situation. It's giving thanks to God in a situation that you look at and you think, no way can I give thanks to God in this. Psalm 27, look at what he's going through. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the defense of my life. Whom shall I dread? When evildoers came upon me to devour my flesh, my adversaries and my enemies, they stumbled and fell. Though a host encamp against me, my heart will not fear. Though war arise against me, in spite of this, I shall be confident. Verse 5. For in the day of trouble He will conceal me in His tabernacle. In the secret place of His tent He will hide me. He will lift me up on a rock. And now my heart will be lifted up above my enemies around me. And I will offer in His tents sacrifices of shouts of joy. And I will sing, yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. The psalmist is going through a very distressing, difficult time. Armies, he says, have arisen against him. He is finding himself in a very hard, difficult place. And yet, he says, in that situation, he will offer in his tent, that is, in the tabernacle, God's tent, sacrifices of shouts of praise. Now, your translation may say sacrifices with shouts of praise, but the literal Hebrew is sacrifices 
of shouts of praise. And that's all the difference in sacrifices with shouts of praise. I believe his shouts of praise in this distressing situation, those were his sacrifice that he was lifting before the Lord. Also again in Psalm 69 that we will look at more fully in a moment, we see David offering up the sacrifice of thanksgiving when he says in verses 29 and 30, But I am afflicted and in pain. May your salvation, O God, set me securely on high. I will praise the name of the Lord with song and magnify Him with thanksgiving. And then as we move to the New Testament, we see it mentioned in Hebrews 13, 15. Through Him... Let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is, the fruit of lips that give thanks to His name. Now there was a sacrifice of thanksgiving in the Old Testament that was a part of the peace offerings. But that's not what I'm talking about this morning. I'm talking about the offering up of thanks to God in what appears in every way to be a thankless situation. Now why is it called the sacrifice of praise? First, because you must sacrifice your mind to give thanksgiving to the Lord in this. You cannot see anything to be thankful for in this situation. And so you have got to sacrifice your mind. You cannot reason at all how you can be thankful. So you sacrifice your own thinking in this situation. Secondly, you must sacrifice your heart, your emotions. You feel anything but thankful in this situation. So you have to sacrifice your feelings. And then thirdly, you've got to sacrifice your will. You don't want to give thanks in this situation. It's the furthest thing from what you want to do. You want to gripe. You want to complain. You want to tell God off. You want to shake your fist at God. You don't want to give thanks. So you've got to sacrifice your will in this situation. So it's called the sacrifice of thanksgiving. Sacrifice what you think about it. Sacrifice how you feel about it. Sacrifice what you want to do about it. Now let's look in more detail at Psalm 69 as we look at David's situation. And first, I want you to see how bad his situation was, and then we're going to look at his sacrifice of thanksgiving. Beginning with verse 1, he finds himself in a very distressing situation. Look at the figurative way that he mentions and talks about his situation. Save me, O God, For the waters have threatened my life. I have sunk in deep mire, and there is no foothold. It's like he's in quicksand, and he's sinking, he's going down. That's another way of saying, man, I'm overwhelmed. This situation is totally taking me under. I have come into deep waters, and a flood overflows me. He's saying, I'm sunk. Man, this thing is just taking over me. I can't get my head above water. He says in verse 3, I am weary with my crying, and my throat is parched. He has cried so much, he doesn't have any more tears. He's cried so much, his throat is parched. My eyes fail while I wait for my God. He doesn't see God in this situation anywhere. He goes on to say, those who hate me, without cause of more than the hairs of my head. And those who would destroy me are powerful, being wrongfully my enemies. And what I did not steal, I have to restore. He's been falsely accused and he's having to give things back he never stole. And then look at verse 7. Even his family has turned against him. Because for your sake I have borne reproach, Dishonor has covered my face. I have become estranged from my brothers and an alien to my mother's sons. Family should stick with us when no one else does. You should be able to count on family no matter what. 
But here David says, even his family, his brothers, have forsaken him. They have turned against him. They have left him in his dreadful situation. He's misunderstood. Beginning in verse 9. For zeal for your house has consumed me, and the reproaches of those who reproach you has fallen on me. When I wept in my soul with fasting, it became my reproach. Now you and I talk about the importance of prayer and fasting, don't we? And how it is to be in times of great stress that we need to hear from the Lord that we might want to institute fasting in addition to our prayers. A noble thing. Here, David does it, and they ridicule him for it. They make fun of him. He's just trying to be spiritual. He's just trying to act all holier than thou. He's misunderstood. They make fun of him. It becomes his scorn. They mock him. Verse 11, when I make sackcloth my clothing, I become a byword to them. Again, sackcloth was a way of dressing when you showed you were in grief and you were upset. Well, he does this and they make fun of him. He's just acting. Look at him. He just wants us to feel sorry for him. Look at him. He becomes a byword. And if that's not bad enough, in verse 12, those who sit in the gate talk about me and I'm a song of the drunkards. When the drunk people sing their songs of mockery, they sing about David. Such ridicule. No one sympathizes or even cares. Verse 20. Reproach has broken my heart. I am so sick. And I looked for sympathy, but there was none. I looked for comforters, but I found none. They also gave me gall for my food and for my thirst. They gave me vinegar to drink. They didn't care about him. They didn't sympathize with him. They didn't lift one finger to help him. If anything, they harmed him and hurt him when they gave him gall to drink for food and vinegar to drink. This is his way of saying they didn't lift one finger to help me at all. They could, have cared, could not have cared less for me. No one sympathized. No one cared. But then, in the midst of that, look what he does in verse 29. But I am afflicted and in pain. May your salvation, O God, set me securely on high. I will praise the name of the Lord with song. I will magnify Him with thanksgiving. Even in the midst of this horrendous situation... David says, I will offer the sacrifice of thanksgiving to my God. I will praise Him and thank Him in this situation. Even though it looks so thankless. Now notice God's response to this sacrifice of thanksgiving. It is very pleasing to Him. Verse 31, And it will please the Lord better than an ox or a young bull with horns and hoofs. In other words, better than giving God a perfect sacrifice of this perfect cow, this perfect ox. And you know God commanded the sacrifices. They were pleasing to Him. But He says, when I give Him the sacrifice of thanksgiving, it pleases Him more than all the perfect animals I might offer. Because it means so much. Because it is such an expression before God. It pleases Him. And look at how the others respond. Verse 32, And the humble have seen it and are glad. You who seek the Lord in your heart, you, will seek, you who seek the Lord, let your heart revive. It's going to revive those who are looking on, who are watching, when they see this person, when they see you lift up the sacrifice of thanksgiving to God and thank Him for your situation, it revives the saints. They say, my, that's encouraging. That lifts me up. If they can thank God in their situation, I can thank Him in mine. And it pleases the Lord more than the ox more than the perfect sacrifices. Now why is the sacrifice of thanksgiving so 
pleasing to God. Why does it magnify Him so much? Three reasons. First, because it expresses faith. You remember, faith is the conviction of things not seen. You cannot see why you should be thankful in this situation. But you exercising faith are going to thank God for this thing. Because in faith, you believe what God said in Romans 8, 28, and 29, that my God causes all things to work together for good, that is for your benefit, for your good, to those who love Him, to those who are called according to His purpose, those who are true believers, for those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to become conformed to the image of His Son. God says that even this situation that is so tragic, God says He will use it to conform you to the image of Jesus. And so when you thank Him for that, you're exercising faith. Secondly, it requires obedience over in 1 Thessalonians 5 18 and 19 the scripture says and this is a command in the Greek in everything give thanks in some things most things all things in all things give thanks why? For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the Spirit. You have got to sacrifice your will, because you don't want to thank God for this, but as an act of obedience, because God says, in everything give thanks to Him, you are giving thanks to God as an act of obedience. Obedience. You're not saying this thing is a good thing that happened. You're acknowledging God can bring good in it, but you're not saying in and itself is good. And you are acting in obedience to lift up the words of things. And then thirdly, it releases our bitterness. Look in Ephesians 5.20. Always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to God, even the Father. When you thank God for that situation, there brings some healing deep within you. It releases bitterness or anger or resentment or whatever you may have had toward the situation or toward God. When you thank Him for that, How much better would the elder son in the parable of the prodigal son have been if when his brother came back and his father threw that great feast for his prodigal son, if the elder brother had thanked God that his brother had returned, thanked God that his father was honoring his wayward son more than honoring him who had stayed faithful, and he had thanked God for that, how much trouble he could have saved himself and how much bitterness and offended spirit he could have prevented in his own heart. Thanking God releases that bitterness that we hold on to because of things that have happened to us. So why is it Please God so much because it expresses faith, because it requires obedience, and because it releases bitterness. Now in Hebrews 13, 15, we see the key to all of this. It says, through Him, who is the Him? Jesus. Through Jesus then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is, the fruit of lips 
that give thanks to His name. You will not be able to do this in your own strength. You will not be able to do this in your own power. It is too hard. It is too difficult because the pain is so deep. But through Him, through Jesus, you can offer the sacrifice of praise, the fruit of thankful lips. God, through your power, Jesus, and only in your power, I'm going to look to you to enable me to thank you in this situation. I'm going to thank you for it by faith. Now let's go back to that thing that came to your mind as the worst thing that's ever happened to you in your life. Are you willing to offer to God the sacrifice of thanksgiving today? To put some teeth in your thanksgiving? It's not hard to thank God for good things. Are you willing to thank Him for that? I want us to spend some moment, moments in prayer. I want you to do business with God. You talk to Him. And I hope you will be willing to offer the sacrifice of thanksgiving this morning for that thing in your life. Let's pray. Welcome you, and I'm glad that you have taken the opportunity to listen to a sermon on our Internet. And I want you just to know that uh, everybody in the church is not like me. Uh, I have these fellows up here, our leadership team, uh, this is Filiberto Medina, who is our Hispanic pastor. And our Hispanic congregation meets every Sunday evening at 6.30. This is Paul Kumar. He is our Minister of Community Connections. Uh, and to my left is Mark Baker, who heads up our Reformers Unanimous Ministry, which is a Christian addiction recovery program that meets every Friday night at 7 o'clock. So if you live in the Mableton area... Uh, and it doesn't matter what race you're from, it doesn't matter your cultural background, I want you to know you are welcome at Westside Church. This is where everybody is somebody and Jesus is Lord. Hope you'll join us soon. Thank you for being with us for this message. Each week, Dr. Stewart gives practical applications and ways to live out the Word of God. If you would like more information, please take a moment to view our website at wbcfamily.org. That's wbcfamily.org.